Will Barlow, welcome to Rest Studio. So glad to chat with you again today. Thanks for having me back, Sean. It's a pleasure. And today we're looking at episode two of your Scripture and Science class. I noticed you called it Scripture and Science and not Science and Scripture. That's right. <laughs> Was that intentional? Yes. Yeah. Scripture first. Yeah. For a couple of reasons. Number one, because I think it should take primacy in, in some in some respects. Um, certainly the questions that uh, we want Scripture to answer, it should definitely come first. Um, and, uh, and then also because in the class, I start with scripture. I mean, we, we basically do five sessions of scripture before we even start really in detail talking about science. Mm -hmm. So two, two reasons for it. Very good. Very good. So this is my chance to grill you a little bit and ask you questions <laughs> that came to my mind as I was listening through and considering your points in this last episode, which is called background on Genesis one, you spent a lot of time uh, working your way through the, his the history of Moses in particular mm -hmm. and the people of Israel. Uh, I want to ask about that in a second, but first of all, you did make the point early on that we, sh you, you asked the question, should we expect the Bible to speak accurately about science? And you said no. And it was the sort of no that's like, of course not. Why would the Bible speak accurately about science? Could you explain that a little bit? I think the key word in that sentence is expect. Um, you know, there, there is a possibility. And in fact, in the last session of the class, not to get too far ahead of ourselves, but in the last session, uh, we will talk about examples where the Bible does speak uh, in some respects, we could say ahead of its time. And, uh, you know, sort of document in some respects, um, you know, the inspiration of scripture to some degree. Uh, we can see some things that happened that were very, very su surprising um, in terms of things that were revealed in scripture that only got understood by science much, much, much later. And so there, I do, I do want to leave space for that kind of phenomenon because that definitely does happen. And it's important to recognize that. But the question, the question as I posed it in that session is more, if I come to the Bible, I'm coming to the Bible with my modern Western worldview that's steeped in the modern physics and the modern chemistry and the modern biology and all of those terminologies uh, that go along with that. And that when we really sit back and think about um, what kind of vocabulary would Moses have been working with to even communicate that, could Moses have even understand, uh, understood that kind of stuff in his own language, in his own time, in his own culture? And so I think I think the question is is answered very very clearly. No, I mean he there's no way that he would have had all those things. I think the larger question with when we talk about Genesis one is, and I think a lot of a lot of my friends that hold to old Earth views, people that I know that hold to like a day age or a modified day age view, or that hold to a gap view of one or another, a lot of them believe what they believe is is that there's enough space in those words in that language that that Moses used in Genesis enough space to sort of fit in some of these scientific things that we later people understand better and can sort of see why things were ordered and structured the way that they were maybe in a way that Moses didn't even understand at the time so I, I think that there's space for something like that but I don't think that if we're approaching this from a an original reader, original listener kind of a perspective. I don't, I just don't think evolution or the age of the universe or the age of the earth or big bang, any of this stuff would have been relatable or understandable, um, at least in the way that we understand them. Right. Uh, and you do address this more later on where you ask about like, well, what centuries science would you like there to be in the Bible, you know? Right. Um, yeah. And uh, we'll, we'll leave that for listeners to pick up on later. Uh, you spent much of the time thinking about and retelling the story of the children of Israel going down to Egypt, how they were enslaved, how God raised up Moses, how he led them out. Why did you do that? What does Exodus have to do with Genesis, considering the fact that Genesis, ha Genesis happened before Exodus? Right. And, and again, it circles back to this question of who wrote uh, Genesis and, and who was the original audience of Genesis. And there's a lot of different views. And, um, you know, maybe we'll have a chance to talk about that a little bit more here as well, because we talk, I talk about that in the session as well a little bit. Um, but if we assume, let's just assume for the moment that Moses was the original author of Genesis, 
uh, then we know when he wrote it, he essentially would have written it during that um, time in the wilderness, that 40 year period in the wilderness. That's the only time in his life where that could have happened. And so the reason why we're talking about that is even though the events of Genesis happened over here, they were getting officially written down and, and put on paper during the time of the Exodus, quite literally during the time of the Exodus in that 40 year period. And so, again, the original audience, the original people that would have been listening to it or in the generations that immediately followed that, if we, again, assuming Moses was the one who, who wrote Genesis and Exodus and so on, um, that original audience would have been that group of people who had been enslaved for a long period of time, who um, had maybe some probably oral tradition passed down that maybe was fading over time. And what was around them, you know, sort of like in living color day in and day out was the rampant idolatry of the Egyptians who already had a creation myth, who had a pantheon of gods, who had stories that could have replaced if the if the Hebrews had stayed there longer, could have replaced the original story of Abraham if they had been stayed there long enough. Yeah, you make me think of just the whole question of writing any kind of book or even a blog post or something short that uh a good author always asks the question, who is going to read this? And if it's written for children, it's different. If it's, I recently went over to the Democratic Republic of the Congo. And even though I was preaching material that I had developed long ago, I had to redo all of it because none of my analogies worked. And Speaking through a translator is totally different. It gives you way too much time to think and second guess yourself and edit content. And in my experience, result in a very short, short sermon that's really concentrated, which isn't isn't going to be easy. Um, and so I had to change a lot of things and you know insert a lot of French as well because it was a French speaking context um, and some Lingala, which is a local dialect. You know, so it just totally changed. Um, the content that I, I chose, I selected. Right. Um, and so you're saying that by understanding the world of the audience of Genesis chapter one better, uh, we can ask the questions that they were asking. We could read it the way they were reading. Why is that important to read it the way they were reading? Well, again, because if we are, we're asking questions based on our worldview. I mean, we're, we are, I mean, it's really hard to, to, to do the hard work of disconnecting ourselves from our own worldview. And in some respects, it's impossible. I mean, because there are, there are always implicit assumptions that we will miss in our analysis of our assumptions. And I mean, it just becomes very difficult to do that kind of a, a task. But, but what I'm trying to ask people in the class is just very high level, uh, sort of a macro scale, basic assumptions about the Bible. And um, again, if we can, if we can identify that the, at least the early audience, even if we go with the documentary hypothesis or other views on, on scripture, on, on Genesis through, through Deuteronomy, even if we go with a later view, I mean, the, the latest it gets is like Ezra finishing it up in five, four or 500, you know, BC. I mean, and so you're still not talking about a modern Western science, you know, science laden kind of an audience. Um, that kind of an audience still has an ancient Near East perspective. And so uh, trying to put ourselves in that perspective, in that in their worldview as much as possible, allows us to read the scripture, I would say, in some sense, more organically, uh, because we're taking it as much as we can on its own terms. And again, I know that to do that perfectly, you've got to be in a time machine going back in time and studying the people right. yeah. directly. We're not going to be able to do that. But we do have good historians. We do have um, you know, linguists and, and experts in different fields that can tell us more about um, the kinds of things that they had in their worldview. And, and of course, Egyptology and other studies in terms of understanding the other cultures around them at that time is also incredibly helpful. And we do know a fair amount about the ancient world, uh, surprisingly, uh, given all the archaeological finds that we've, that we've uncovered in the last, especially 200 years or so. So I, I don't think it's an impossible task. And especially on a macro level, I think we can do it um, pretty easily. And, and the approach that, that I took is similar to approaches that have been taken by other scholars. I mentioned Kimball's book, uh, but there's also another book sort of behind Kimball's book called In the Beginning We Misunderstood, which was written by two, uh, two scholars who used to hold to a young earth view and then essentially gave it up for a non-literal view. Um, and so, um, 
and again, not not subscribing to that that approach being the, the right approach or whatever, but but just pointing out that this is a common scholarly thing that people are doing today is saying, hey, what kind of questions were they asking? Let's read the Bible first from that perspective of you know who is this God that rescued us? Are we going to be safe here in the wilderness? Um, you know, what do we need to do to placate this God? You know, these are the types of questions they would have been asking, not. Um, you know, did did dinosaurs exist 6,000 years ago or 300 million years ago, or they didn't even know what a dinosaur was, you know, right. and, and as far as we can tell. Um, and so, you know, let's ask, let's ask and answer the questions that they would have asked first, and then we can see maybe there's room for our questions too. And I think that there is, but, but I think we have to start with the, the primary thing and then we can go to the secondary thing. Yeah. Yeah. We want to avoid anachronism. We want to avoid reading uh later ideas into earlier texts because that's just a good way to misunderstand something and uh so i don't know i was i was equal parts sort of like understood what you were doing and also kind of annoyed like just get to the science you know and i uh but i appreciate why you did what you did because you're laboring to basically take our heads and put us into that world and ask those kinds of questions. You also mentioned the documentary hypothesis of Julius Wellhausen. Now, when I was in seminary, uh, that way of slicing up the Torah was considered dogma. Uh, in other words, you you could not question it. It's un it's unassailable. So, uh, you know, fundamentalists are often ridiculed uh, for being excessively rigid and unwilling to consider alternatives. Well. Pfft, in liberal seminaries, guess what? They're just as rigid. They just have different principles that they hold to. And one of them is this documentary hypothesis. Um, and so questioning it for, for many people is considered intellectual suicide. Uh, I, I wonder if you could give me some reasons. You know, I'm not sure how much you've looked into it or not, but uh, some reasons why you don't find this particular theory, the documentary hypothesis, convincing. Yeah, well, I think... I think, again, looking at it from a scientific perspective as much as possible, you know, you have to start with some assumptions and then your assumptions lead you to a hypothesis and a hypothesis and can, can then get tested. And I think that, that when you look at the documentary hypothesis through a scientific lens like that, there are some major problems with it. The first two are assumptions. Um, one of the assumptions that they made, um, Wellhausen and that whole school uh, made when they first came up with the theory was, um, that there was no written language at the time of Moses. Now, look, if there's no written language at the time of Moses, then the documentary hypothesis is slam dunk. Like, it's obviously true. It's one of those things where if the assumption is true, then it's almost like, well, of course, it had to be multiple people over a period of time because Moses couldn't have done it. You know, it's like one of those things where the whole evangelical, you know, story on it goes just, you know, screaming into the night, it's just gone, you know? Um, and so... Uh, the problem is, is that that theory was developed in the 1800s. And in the last 150 years, we found tons of tons of evidence of written language that goes back well before Moses. And so you have um, you have all these examples. And so that's that's uh, that's problem. That's problem number one. Problem number two, the other assumption that Wellhausen and that whole school makes, I would say that probably liberal scholarship to this day probably makes the same mistake. And it's the same mistake I think a lot of a lot of atheists, scientific uh, atheists make is that they they will discredit the idea of a miracle before you even put it into to the test. You know, it's like there can be no miracles. And so um, so there's no inspiration, there's no miracles, there's no Ten Commandments being written by the finger of God. Like all of that's just like obviously wrong. Uh, it reminds me of Thomas Jefferson's famous New Testament where he keeps all the teachings of Jesus and then he cuts out all the miracles. He says these are embellished accounts of, of you know later people they never really happened right. and so you end up with a with a gospel with the gospels being you know half the length of the original because all the miracles are stripped out of it yeah it um, tells you a lot more about jefferson than it does about jesus <laughs> exactly exactly and so i think i think those two assumptions going into the documentary hypothesis both uh, really um cause a lot of damage to it um and then you know you think about the process itself again if 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 textual criticism which I think is helpful, by the way. I think textual criticism as a general rule is a helpful endeavor. I'm not trying to slight the whole branch of study. I think that there are you know, great things that have come out of textual criticism. 
But the problem when you use textual criticism without any other like barriers or, or guardrails um, is you end up with, why end up with four? Why not end up with six sources or eight sources or 10 sources? I mean, where do you stop slicing and dicing? Um, and I think it, it makes a real big methodological problem for the documentary hypothesis in my mind, uh, because I just don't see a clear cut way you could just decide that. I mean, I get the whole, you know, like the J source uses Jehovah and the E source uses Elohim. You know, th that seems like a consistent rule. But some of these other rules, it's like, well, they say something favorable about priests. So that's the priestly source or they say, so, you know, it's like, how are we making these decisions? And I think we could make different decisions and come up with six or eight or five or 10 sources and very easily slice and dice it even to more pieces. Mm -hmm. um, and so I don't, I don't think that it, it lends to a repeatable result. It's not, um, it's not obvious when you approach the text that that's the way you should approach it. Yeah. And then the final thing I would say is that um, the biblical record just flat out contradicts it. Um, if you look at how the Bible talks about those books for the rest of the Bible, I mean, starting in Joshua, going all the way through the prophets and the historical books, all the way into the New Testament, the words of Jesus, the words of Paul, the words of Paul is portrayed by Luke in the book of Acts. Everyone calls these the book of Moses. Every single one of them calls them the book, the books, the book of Moses. So, right. and they even call them basically, basically one book. It's not even like five books of Moses. Like this is the book of the law that Moses wrote down. It is one book. And, you know, so is there a possibility that like Moses didn't write like the last chapter or two of Deuteronomy that describes his death? Like I'm open to that, but other than that, you know, I just think, you know, there's no reason to believe that Moses couldn't write poetry and history and all the other genres. Like there's there's no problem with my mind of him doing all that um, and for him to be able to do it. He was trained, um, according to the Bible, he was trained in the court of the Egyptians, which was the most advanced culture of the time. And so he probably would have known how to write from a, from a purely historiographical perspective. Um and so I just think that there's no reason to accept that hypothesis when the biblical one seems to be actually better. Yeah. Well, let's talk about inspiration then. Uh, I'm guessing you don't believe God dictated the sacred history contained in the book of Genesis to Moses, right? I, yeah. Dictation is a funny question because there are, I think there are things in the Bible that were dictated. Mm -hmm. Like I'll give the example, like the 10 commandments, it says it was written by the finger of God. I think, I think we can agree that was that was dictated. I mean, if, if we believe Moses came down with tablets, yeah, that God had like laser etched miraculously <laughs> right. into the stone or whatever, like that's the definition of dictation. So yeah. so I'm open, I'm open to pockets of dictation throughout the Bible. Uh, but I don't think that the whole Bible has to be dictation, no. I, I think I think that um well, we're talking about the, Genesis in particular. Yes. Yeah, I think that I think that you know the whole Bible and, and, you know, just on a macro level is a human divine, uh, you know, thing. It's a thing that, that, that God, you know, he, he spoke to humans and they wrote stuff down and it's not like they dictate, he dictated stuff, but it's like, you know, Paul sat down at some point and wrote Ephesians. It's not like God was whispering in his ear. This is how you write Ephesians. He just wrote a letter and sent. And I think in you know some respects, Paul, for his part, Paul may never have even thought what he was writing was scripture. Um, but I think Moses was trying to put down a historical record, and a lot of that could have definitely come from an oral tradition that existed long before right, Moses. Well, then how do you distinguish what you just said there from just uh, no inspiration? You know, like, say, an atheist yeah. would probably just heartily amen what you just said there about Paul writing his his letter, didn't think he was writing scripture, yeah. just sat down and wrote a letter. Like, yeah. you do believe in inspiration. So yes. maybe you can explain a little more. Yeah, again, you know, um, I guess the biggest contrast I can give is like the Book of the Book of Mormon is a good example because the Book of Mormon supposedly came from heaven on plates, on golden plates, and then Joseph Smith was tasked with translating those plates. And so God, could God have done that? Could God have literally levitated plates down to the earth in Hebrew or in any other language and tasked Moses or someone else with translating it? Or just like, you know, like he could have, just levitated like an English Bible down. That's like perfectly translated from all the ancient sources. And he, he hasn't done that. And he, you know, it doesn't seem like that's in his, his interest to do that. And so I think that we have to understand from my perspective, the Bible is, is, is a human divine relationship. It's part of the whole thing. Um, our whole relationship with God is human, human divine interaction. Yeah. And the Bible, I don't think in some sense is different from that. Now I do think that the men that God tasked with, writing down these these books 
um, were specially endowed with, with spiritual gifts that are in some cases beyond what um, many of us experience in our lifetimes. And so I'm not trying to minimize that. You know, Moses was a fantastic prophet on a level uh, that scar- you know, scarcely gets equaled even in the Bible, much less in modern times. Yeah. And so I, I think that there's a space, there's space there for God working within the person who's, who's writing things down, not necessarily dictating to them, but you know, he, let, let's say he received an oral history. Like I'm sure you've received oral history about your family. I, I, for example, received oral history about my family, about an ancestor of mine who stopped a KKK rally. Now, I've never found a written source that's corroborated that. I just accept that that's true because I have this oral, oral tradition. But now my grandfather eventually sat down to write a book for all of us. And I think he does talk about that in the book. So now I have a written, I have a written record of it in addition to the oral tradition that was passed down. And so I think for Moses, you know, he's writing Genesis or you know, any of the first five books of the Bible. And I think there were things that he was just told by people. And then God could have confirmed that to him. And of course, Moses had an incredibly special relationship with God. Um, and so I, don't, I think that there's space for things to be put in Moses' own words, in his own language, in his own culture, in his own time, that could still, it could still be completely true. Um, and so I think that's the balance that we have to find with these conversations about inerrancy. Yeah. Um, and I, I think there's a range of, of possibilities and, and I'm, I'm where I'm at and you're where you're at and people listening are where they're at and we may all be close or we may be a little bit further apart. But I think, I think we have to account for the fact that God just didn't give us plates because he could have, he could have just given us a Bible in English and he didn't. Well, let's uh, explore that a little bit more on two words coming to mind f- for this uh, reliability and authority. Um would you say that you have a high level of confidence that what Moses wrote in the book of Genesis is what God wanted him to write, that he's a reliable source in that sense? And then number two, would you also say that the text is authoritative? Not that Genesis necessarily gives us like lots of commands or anything, but if it did, let's say Genesis contained the word, the uh the commandments uh you shall not have more than three children wait yeah you have two so you have one on the way so you'd still be good there i would be in violation i have four children but uh let's just say that there was some commandment there and it was for all time and all people or whatever and uh you know would you would you look at that and say well i believe this is reliable and that it has in some way it has god's authority behind it so i better obey it or would you look at it a a different way how how would you think about it i mean i I think if it's in genesis i mean you said it was for all peoples in all times which i think is an assumption that we'd have to bring to the text at that point but i think that would be the question i would ask is is this for all people and for all times or is this something that was limited to the the time frame of whatever time period he was describing uh, or, or proclaiming that, I think if it if it is for all people and for all time, and it and it looks like maybe that maybe that commandment gets quoted in the book of Hebrews, or maybe it gets quoted somewhere later in the New Testament. Uh, absolutely, it's authoritative, and I would have no problem, you know, holding to that kind of a thing. Yeah. Um, well, I just um, kind of put that thought experiment out there because there there are plenty of um, more uh, liberal leaning Christians who would take the position, well. No, because everything is contextual. Everything is culturally conditioned. Uh, therefore, I have to use my own, you know, modern sensibilities to judge what in scripture I should obey and what I, so any, any, in other words, the self is the locus of authority, not right. the scripture. And so that's really where I think, and this is just maybe my opinion, but like all these different theories of inspiration come down is mm-hmm. like, well, what? if I disagree with scripture, do I have to change or does it, does it, can I just safely say, okay, that doesn't apply to me or what? (laughs) Right. Yeah. I mean, that's the most dangerous thing we can do, right. Is just say, Oh, Hey, this thing doesn't apply to me. That's, that's for them. That's for this time. And I think we have to be very careful. I mean, we have to be very, very careful about that. Okay. Well, let's move on. Um, In a world without, I always feel like when I say in a world is like that uh, trailer voice, 
this summer in a world. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, in a world without streaming shows and movies and short addicting videos, people told stories in person, right? So would you agree that much of the history contained in Genesis was oral tradition? passed on from generation to generation you kind of uh you kind of hand wave that in the episode um mm-hmm. and I, I i will i wanted to probe that a little bit more because that's kind of like my thinking on it is that at least like the first 11 chapters of genesis is not family history in the sense that like you were saying your example of uh right. you know yeah recent you know generations like so like the first 11 yeah. chapters is like you know obviously well i mean it's not obvious i think it's or- orally passed down um right. but uh yeah I'd, l- I'd like to hear your comments on that and you know why then ask the question why if it was orally passed down should we trust it because there's all kinds of orally passed down things that we don't trust <laughs> right yeah i mean I guess people think of oral oral tradition as like um, like you're playing the game of telephone and you are yes. getting a circle and you like you like whisper the one word or the phrase and then by the end you know the phrase is completely different and like yep. uh, you know there's always the risk that like someone intentionally messes it up in the halfway you know and like completely gets everybody off track or just the accident you know the people just make a mistake and and that's not at all what I think. Um, I think of when I think of oral tradition or I think a lot of scholars think about oral tradition, like you said, ancient people, they didn't have television or, uh, or even radios or, you know, any of that stuff. So, you know, what are they, what are they doing? They're sharing stories. I mean, the human, the humans have always been wired to enjoy and and remember stories. And, and I I think that that's part of maybe even God's design of us biologically uh, to be able to remember stories. And, And that's why as a pastor, I mean, why do you tell stories during sermons? Because they relate to people, they, they connect with their emotions, and then they remember. If they remember yeah. anything from the sermon, they're going to remember the story that you told. And so I think that's a powerful example of, of what stories can do for us as, as human beings. And so I definitely think that stories were passed down. Uh, incidentally, you mentioned the first 11 chapters of Genesis. Uh, the, the floods in that section of the first 11 chapters, and that's a story that we see in so many cultures around the world. Mm-hmm. Uh, with details that are similar to the details in the Bible, uh, which we'll get to later in the class. But um, but I do think that, you know, that that things did get passed on in, in great detail. Um, and I think even in, in modern times, I mean, there have been people that have memorized, for example, the whole New Testament or the whole Bible. I mean, the human mind is capable of amazing things. And so the idea that that someone could memorize the story of Joseph or the story of Abraham Um, or just even subsections of it, like Abraham and Isaac, Um, you know, that's not hard for us to imagine that they could have had that information. Um, I think the point that I was trying to make in the class too is, is that you have that oral tradition and you have that um, probably like a national identity we could call it or something like that, this heritage that they were trying to preserve, but it's incredibly difficult to do that when you're slaves and you're subjugated under an oppressive oppressive regime and you've got this idolatry all around you and that's that's more the concern that when you know when moses is going to write this stuff down i think he did have the oral tradition but i also i also think god probably had to show him things at times details that were lost maybe to the tradition the oral tradition or um specific things that no one in the oral tradition would have known because only god knew those things and again that's not dictation that's just god maybe giving Moses a vision of this is how it sort of went. And, you know, that's then Moses wrote down what he saw in the vision. You know, it, there's yeah. many ways it could happen. Um, yeah. So I'm well, I appreciate you explain, expounding on that yeah. a little bit more. That's really helpful. Uh, you said the Bible, along with other creation literature from the time in this episode we're talking about, teaches that the world is flat. And mm-hmm. So this is going to get us into a topic, uh, not myself, but, the people that are into it are super passionate about yeah. why the earth is flat. Uh, but you, you did mention that. So that's kind of like uh, asking for uh, that's, that's an invitation right there for, for further conversation on it. But you said the Bible along with other creation literature from the time teaches that the world is flat and that there's a solid dome suspended from which it rains. Uh, you also said we don't have to believe that ourselves. 
Are you mm-hmm. saying we shouldn't trust the Bible? No, no, not at all. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so uh, this is the part that gets interesting, right? Because um, like I said, like, I, like I've talked about, science, science is fluid throughout all time. And so it's like, which science do you pick? Do you pick the science that they, that they believed? Do you, do you pick the science that we believe somewhere in between? You know, which slide, the science that they're going to believe in 200 or a thousand years if Jesus doesn't come back, you know, what science do we pick? And so um, if the science of the time, and I think I, I, you know, I don't come down too firmly on this because I know there are alternate explanations for it, but I'm willing to grant, I'm willing to grant that the ancient cultures believed essentially in a flat earth and that they believed in the, the solid dome. You know, there's certainly people in the Bible that very clearly hold to that. If everyone did or not, it's very hard to tell. But let's just assume that that's what everyone believed. Um, even if that's what everyone believed, if that was their science at their time, and that was the way that God communicated to them in a way that they would understand, you know, that's okay. That's great. Then that's the understanding that they received the text in. And then as modern Western people who have seen satellite imagery of the earth from space, we don't have to hold to that. We can still understand that the Bible reveals some essential truth about how the world works while letting, letting science sort of take the, the major role in understanding physics and the world around us and things like that. And so it's not that we don't believe in the Bible at all. There is, there is essential truth that is taught in Genesis 1, that there is this God, Yahweh, who created all things and that, uh, that he wants man to be, um, to rule alongside him and that he set things up to be ordered and to be very good. You know, these are the types of things that we can learn that are essential truths from Genesis that are very trustworthy. And if we believe that they had a worldview that taught a flat earth, my point is we don't have to limit ourselves to their science. We should limit ourselves to the, the essential truths that the Bible reveals, but we don't have to limit ourselves to their science. We can allow our science to supersede their science on questions essentially of science. Okay. Uh, it seems like it seems like you're defining, you know, you just said the phrase essential truths. Mm-hmm. So um, you're defining that as non-scientific truths. You know, it seems like you're um, taking the old infallibility position, which is to say the Bible can be wrong about science and history but it can't be wrong about doctrine and practice. Uh, and I don't think you would probably affirm something so simplistic because that's just like arbitrarily um, neatly defined. <laughs> mm-hmm. But um, yeah, let's say somebody pushed back and said, you know, I think the scientific insight of the Bible is essential truth as well. Like uh, why, why, why are you, singling this out or let's say let's even say an atheist is pushing back and the atheist is saying well that's convenient for you isn't it like the part of the bible that we know for sure is wrong you are just going to admit it's wrong but still believe that god inspired it you know like i I feel like there's a lot of tension here will with this way of talking um and it's it's not uh, it's not a comfortable place. So maybe you could talk a little bit more about it. <laughs> well, that and that's why I started where, with like how I can the Bible be about... wrong about science and we still believe in the Bible? Right. right? Yeah. That seems. Yeah. Weird I to mean, me. it just comes down to what you believe about. Again, it comes. I think it comes back a lot to our, our doctrine of of inspiration of the of the text because if we hold to a dictation view which is the view I essentially, I think, grew up with more or less. I don't know if you would view uh, the view you grew up with as dictation or not, but I essentially, I at least pictured it as dictation. Yeah. If, if you view it as dictation, then, uh, then the only limit that Moses would have experienced would have been a linguistic one. In other words, could God have explained quarks to him and the Big, and big Bang cosmology and a, you know, a, certainly a circular Earth. I feel like, you know, like a, a spherical Earth would have yeah. been within the realm of possibility. Sure. And look, there there are many people out there who push back against the flat Earth hypothesis from the Bible. You know, there there, there are verses. And I didn't get into it in the class, um, but uh, there are verses out there that 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 do support a spherical Earth position. So I I don't. Again, I'm not I'm not conceding that ground wholly in the Bible. 
but I do think it's an interesting question regardless, um, regardless of that, if the Bible did, you know, just from stem to stern, just the whole thing taught a flat earth, you know, what do we do? What do I do with an atheist who says, hey, that's convenient? I think I would just point again, point back to if I'm if I'm historically grounding the text in its culture, in its language, in what was available at the time, everyone believed that at the time. Everyone believed in a more or less flat earth with a dome over it, which held back the water and the rain came through the dome and all that. I mean, that's that's very standard stuff. We can see that in the Babylonian writings. We can see that in the Egyptian writings. We can see it throughout ancient cultures. So. So to say that the Bible, you'd be essentially saying that the Bible has to transcend the time and the culture that, it, that it's in from a scientific perspective. And look, I do think it transcends the time and the culture on the spiritual truth that it teaches. And that's, okay. I guess, the distinction I'm making. But I think on the scientific things, I think it's okay for us to say, hey, look, God communicated to them in the way that they would understand and... Uh, you know, and he didn't feel the need to correct them. And I think I give the example that Walton gives about uh, thinking, thinking in your innards, you know, thinking in your gut. Um, and God didn't correct that ancient understanding either. And yet no one walks around saying your brain isn't sending signals. You know, I think the flat earthers should be consistent. That'd be my pushback, I think, is a flat right. earther should be consistent and say that our brains are in our guts and our abdomens. And if they want to walk around talking about that, I'll at least say, hey, man, you're being consistent. That's good. But if you're if you're you're drawing an arbitrary line between certain things that are scientifically proven in a modern sense versus other things that you think are more questionable from a modern scientific perspective. And I just think that distinction is arbitrary. So my pushback to to a flat earther would be that I want you to write a paper that says that we all think through our gut exclusively. I mean, I know that there's I've actually seen papers that said that gut health does actually affect our brain. So maybe there's something to maybe there's something to what the Bible says about that as well. I don't know. I, I'm I'm willing to I'm willing to be wrong about that. But but I think that flather should be consistent. You know, if if you're gonna if you're gonna hold on to that view, then let's look at some of these other places that might be more difficult, even more difficult than the flat Earth thing. Mm -hmm. um, and so, but then yeah, to an atheist, I mean, I think that that's tough. I mean, I think that that's tough, and I. I talk about that in terms of interpretations of Genesis 1. Look, atheists don't like non-literal interpretations of Genesis 1 because yeah. they think that, you know, we're just essentially saying, hey, the Bible's wrong. We're throwing that piece out and you should believe this piece about Jesus, but don't worry about Genesis 1. And they're like, well, if Genesis 1 is wrong, then isn't Jesus wrong too? I think there's, I think there's a fair point there. And so, uh, you know, I, I don't know how to resolve it other than to say, you know, what would you expect from a text from an ancient culture? Uh, with an ancient, um, you know, understanding of science, I would expect it. What I would expect is for it to be entirely grounded in that science. And again, not trying to skip ahead too far, but in in session sixteen, at the very end of the class, I give examples where it's not entirely grounded in science in the science of the time, and make some pretty incredible predictions about things and some pretty pretty wild um, uh, applications of science that were much later in terms of our, our way of um, unveiling it in historical, actual historical timeline. And so I think that lends to inspiration. In other words, I think that the criticism from an atheist going backwards is weaker than an ancient text saying things scientifically that gets get proven, you know, thousands of years after it was written. I think this direction is way more powerful than an atheist poking at this and saying, well, you know, they couldn't think beyond their own time frame on science. Well, we can't think beyond the Big Bang and evolution. And that's what Thomas Kuhn said. Until the next big scientific revolution comes along, none of us think outside that box. And so I think that's how I'd approach it. I don't know if it'd be satisfactory for every atheist, though. I think you make a great point. Yeah. Yeah, it's a hard it's a hard one. And we'll probably circle back to this again, because I don't want to give away everything uh, right in this uh, little interview. But uh let me let me run a thought by you and see see what you think. Um, if you could if if you could look up all the parts of the Bible that seem to say the Earth is flat, I, I don't think there really are that many, uh, mm -hmm. and I think they're pretty weak. Uh, Mike Winger's done some good work on this and and sort of textually analyzed, ex exegeted them, and a lot of them are like from the ends of the Earth and stuff like that, and. You can find that same expression used for uh, locations or people groups that weren't 
at the end of the earth. It was just like a way of talking about something that's far away. Um, and so be that as it may, let's just assume that for a second, that uh, the references to the earth being flat or to other uh, scientifically inaccurate uh, beliefs they had at their time, that all of these kinds of references are not revelation from God, mm-hmm. but that they are... Uh, they're part of their assumption and that he is going to work within without uh, confirming their error. You know, maybe that's too nuanced of a view, but I kind of want to say that let's say you're talking to somebody that is very simple minded, let's say a child, and they're not capable of abstract thought. Like at a certain mm-hmm. age, you begin to be able to understand abstract thought. And before that, like you can you can work at it till you're blue in the face as a parent. And like the kid just doesn't get it. And it's just frustrating for everyone. Um, and so like imagine God. I, I think the difference between God and, and fully grown humans is greater than the difference between fully grown humans and children. Uh, so that's another assumption. And that, you know, he's he's not going to correct all the things Right. He's just working within it to reveal what he's revealing. What is he revealing? That he is the one true God and that they should trust in him and that, you know, he's more powerful than the other gods of the nations and so on. And so, and that, you know, it's really a lot of it is just trust and covenant and promises about what he's going to do in the future. And, um, you know, it doesn't seem to me that like he reveals a flat, certainly not in Genesis one. And, no. you know, even that word that, uh, you know, the K- KJV translated firmament as if it was a solid dome. That's just like a fancy way of saying solid dome, by the way, firmament. Um, you know, I think that's that word's pretty debated. Like I right. even heard John Walton comment on that, that, uh, yeah, he used to think it was a solid dome and that that's the only way to to think about it but more recent lexicography has revealed that there's you know it could mean um i forget the word he used it was a while ago um but like you know more of like a a misty kind of a thing rather than solid you know Mm -hmm. um i think we have the word expanse in some mm-hmm. of our Bibles for that same word, I think it's the Hebrew word, Rekea, re- 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 I, I don't remember exactly what it was, but uh, you know what I'm talking about, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So like, um, what do you think about that theory that, you know, the science isn't revealed. It's just sort of like part of the language he uses to communicate what he is revealing. Right. I mean, I think I would essentially agree with that, that, yeah, it's, you have like this, this worldview and then you have the communication of these truths and it yeah. has to be fil- it, it has to go through that filter. And so unless, unless you hold a dictation, if you hold a dictation, then maybe, you know, God could reveal things outside of the worldview and just yeah. try to use language, uh, teach Moses language enough to receive that. I think that would be the barrier. But but assuming that we're not, you know, that Moses is not up on Mount Sinai learning new Hebrew words for these concepts that God's teaching him, and it includes like a whole like new way of looking at science. Um, I just, you know, Walton's point in in the Lost World book is simply, why would he do that? Science has always been wrong. Well, all, you know, like we have no reason to believe it'll ever be completely one hundred percent right. And so why would God choose something that's that's moving, that's fluid all the time instead of here? He's just going to communicate with them with their language and the worldview as it is. And like you said, it's like a filter. It's like it's like a filter, basically, where it's like God's revealing these truths. They go through the filter. Moses writes down something. And on the other end of it, again, I'm not conceding. You just got to trust that God knows what he's doing well enough that. Right. Through the filter, he knows stuff isn't going to be twisted to to a point where it's lost in communication for subsequent generations right and again i think you're right i think the flat earth thing is not something that has to be conceded from yeah it's not like there's a a commandment somewhere thus says the lord the earth is flat and it has a solid dome you know like we don't find that in in, any interest in cosmology like that Mm -mm. no 
probably the, like the, actually now that I'm thinking about it, probably the most um, common places where you find this kind of terminology or cosmological terminology is poetry. You know, mm-hmm. like Job and Psalms. Yeah, and in right? Job, the solid dome, the one, the one time when the solid dome is like most most clearly argued for is in the fourth miserable comforter, the last, the last miserable comforter, who some people think is a good guy, some people think is a bad guy. So I don't know what yeah. your take on that is, but he's the one who like the you know like describes the the firmament or the the heavens as a solid dome pretty clearly in the book of Job, and so. Depending on what you think about that guy, maybe that strengthens your case, or maybe that really weakens your case. You know, yeah, yeah. The only Elihu, guy who yeah. that was. I, I yeah. don't, I don't know yeah. that I have a horse in that race, Will. To be honest, um, I don't have positions on every controversy. Just ninety nine point nine percent. Just kidding. Um, yeah, I mean, Job is really a questionable uh source to pull scientific information from um and it really cuts both ways because you can find a verse in job that says god hung the wor- world on nothing uh which sounds right. sounds like it's uh supporting modern gravitation and then you can find Gravit- a verse yeah, that exactly. says there's a solid dome you know and uh it's just right. sort of like a category error to to seek for god's revelation in job in the many words of the many people some of whom god clearly says these guys didn't speak correctly about me which is crazy because like people will quote job and they'll be like this is what the bible says and then they won't quote the verse at the end where it's like these people have not spoken correctly about me um and there's no like statement where god says of job you know you're right about everything no like he totally (laughs) like slaps job around like from chapter yeah. 38 onwards and Ellie who, you know, you're right. He's, he's an enigma. I, I don't really know if, uh, if he's a trustworthy source or not as far as how the book portrays him. Um, mm-hmm. But I know that like, it's just a weird place to go for science. Like it Job is, is obscure. Is. The language, the, you know, the, uh, the Hebrew of Job is the hardest Hebrew in the whole Bible. So many of the words are just like, not even, you know, they're more like guesses than, certainties and uh that's where we're gonna go or the psalms like the right. psalms like i might get myself in trouble with this comment but hey it's toward the end of the video so maybe not too many <laughs> people will watch it but uh of course now it's going to get cut out but uh you know the psalms in my opinion are the least inspired of the whole bible mm. and i know i'm going to get in trouble for saying that but what i mean by that is this what i mean by that is you mentioned the Ten Commandments. Mm-hmm. I would agree with you. The Ten Commandments are the most inspired. You know, mm-hmm. what, what I mean by most and least is like direct. You know, the, mm-hmm. the Ten Commandments are like directly written by God with his finger on a stone. Uh, the prophets, thus mm-hmm. says the Lord. You know, right. these kinds of statements. And then they pres- presumably quote God. To me, this right. is like the high top, yeah. top of the line uh, authoritative inspiration, dictation, hundred uh, like, percent. Yeah. Like, you know, the time when like God gave words to Jeremiah and they were destroyed and Baruch the scribe had to write more down. Like to me, that is dictation. Uh, but that yeah. doesn't mean that like every single part is the same. It's, but with the Psalms, the Psalms are more often than not people's prayers to God, not God's revelation to them. Um, Correct. But I'm gonna I'm gonna put them still in the inspired category, but they're they're just not of the same uh, category or or quality caliber. Yeah, yeah. So <laughs> I don't know if I uh, got myself in trouble there, but uh, you know I I think it is definitely worthwhile to consider that like Job and the Psalms, where people are getting these like science statements from. It's interesting. Mm-hmm. It is. Or maybe like some of the like really poetic sections of the prophets mm-hmm. where like, you know, they use hyperbole and figures of speech left and right. Right. So yeah, he stretches yeah. out the heavens like a garment. You know, is that talking about Big Bang expansion? You know, I I don't know. I don't yeah. know. It's, po- it's poetry. Why, why are you trying right. to? <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not trying to nail it down. I'm just I'm just, you know, it could be. But maybe could, it could be. I probably, don't know. Right. Pro- probably um, not. But 
I, I don't know. I, I don't, I'm not really sure what I would say about that, but I do, I do know that I appreciate you courageously being willing to talk about these kinds of thorny issues with me today. So thanks Will for that. And uh, everybody stay tuned for episode three coming out in a couple of days here. Uh, any, any last thoughts, Will? Thanks John again for having me. It's a pleasure talking to you every single time. All right. Well, uh, That'll bring this episode to a close and we'll catch everybody next time.